in lyric writing, and I discovered this with Frank Sinatra, and I've always kept in mind, the most important thing is ambiguity. Ambiguity so that everybody can dig it. You go one, you go two, you don't, if you go too far, you turn into meaninglessness. And if you go too far the other way, then you're telling people exactly what they should be thinking. But somewhere is this sublime sweet spot of ambiguity where each listener can hear a song, my song or other songs that are like that, that I thought about. Because I would listen to a song that had ambiguity and was, I'm going, now this feels like this guy's singing to me and yet it's a very ambiguous song. How is he actually doing that? And I was sort of, so when, by the time I was writing songs like Under the Milky Way, I'm specializing in this idea of leaving this, giving them guidelines and letting the song, letting the words just be a sprinkle on top of what the music's already telling them. But if you tell them too much um, and, and sort of having the right mixture of hope and longing and desire and yearning and all that stuff to make people feel this kind of, yeah, you know, I wish I was, but I've, so many people, to so many people it means so many different things. And I never, I never say that is right or that is wrong. It's like, that's what it's all about. Well, Steve Kilby, first of all, thank you so much for, for joining me. Uh, I, I want to first talk about how prolific you are um, as a, songwriter because in a, in a sense you've got like a zappa-esque body of work in your you know sort of over 40 year history can you give me some idea about how prolific you have been and how that continued um i've always been very prolific um i got more prolific when um recording when i learned in 1977 uh, there was a revolution in technology when TIAC invented the first home four track tape recorder, which meant musicians like me, instead of having to go in the studio and deal with all the argy bargy that, and all of sort of blinding you with science that the guys in the white coats with the great big machine that you weren't allowed to even, suddenly you had it at home. And when I got one of those, I just was obsessed by it. And I just wrote song after song after song and then when I had some set, some success, I even wrote more songs. I was like, it was sort of like my, you know, I'd write a, I'd write a song. One night, Grant McLennan from the Go-Betweens and I walked around the house with a pair of 12 string guitars. And we wrote, I'd say we wrote like 15 really good songs in one night, just one after the other. We were laughing at how they were just coming down the, the line to us. You know what I mean? What's that? Sorry, Steve. Sometimes creativity is that. I mean, I'm a, I'm a screenwriter today, and and when you're in that, you know, when you're in that phase, when you're in that, I forgot what they call it, but when you're in that, that moment, you just uh, uh, continue. But I want to start about, because all these interviews that I do talk at first about um, childhood and the early childhood of the artist. So can you first of all tell me, what music your parents listened to, what you were brought up around? All right. Um, first thing is my father was a piano player and he loved music. And as soon as he could, I could understand, he said, music is the most important thing in life. Please get together with a woman who loves music because my mother didn't like music. As much as my father loved it, she hated it. Anyway, we were very poor. We were British migrants in Australia. And my father had one decent record when we when I was four and he had a little record player. And that record was only The Lonely by Frank Sinatra. And it was all these beautiful torch ballads written by the state of the art, you, you know, recording at, and um, Nelson Riddle doing the orchestrations. And the songs were by all the great songwriters up until, you know, in those days that they had up until the late 50s. And it was just a beautiful album of torch ballads that deeply influenced me about where songs could, oh, just in every way, it made me start thinking about songwriting and it made me think about how these records affected me. And I started in my own childish way, sort of trying to understand songwriting, I think. And I was always, you know, my dad and I drive along in the car and he'd go, what do you think of this song on the radio? 
you know, I go, oh, that's pretty good. And he go, no, nah, that's rubbish. What are you listening? To? Why do you think that's good? And we discuss it. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah. So I was lucky to have that. I was lucky to see my dad playing the piano and, you know, it seemed like if he could do it, I could do it. For that Frank Sinatra album, I mean, the songs are Only the Lonely, Each Place I Go, Only, only the Lonely Go, It's a Lonesome Old Town, Widow Weep for Me, Guess, I'm, guess I'll am Guess i Hang My Tears Out to Dry. How did you feel emotionally? Um, can I tell you, okay, can I tell you about the one that got me the most? And strangely enough, you haven't mentioned it, Angel Eyes. Angel Eyes. Um, Angel Eyes. Um, was about his girlfriend who was who was um obviously angel eyes and there's a line angel eyes that old devil sent they were unbearably bright i've got to know who's now the number one it was sort of like a, it was like a sort of um like a song that was like equivalent of a movie like Bell Book and Candle that st starred Kim Novak. It sort of had magic. It had it had the devil. It had angels, and it had sort of a slightly nightclubby, gangstery, you know. And it was all there in that one song with this wonderful descending bass line and the way Frank sang it. And the last line in the song: "Excuse me while I disappear." And as Frank disappears, there's all these little instruments going to like, like a movie that goes, there will be more to this story. And it was just like to a four year old, it, it was, it was just absolutely, it got, it, it gets me so much more than anything else. Maybe because that was the first thing that rushed into my mind. After that, all songs had to measure up to that in my, in, you know, in some ways, especially if you're going to do a sort of a, a sexy slinky sort of um torch ballady number uh, you you know that was a very high that was a very high bar i think what were your parents going through to be fans of that album because it, you know as I, as i sort of mentioned it's a it's a very it's an, such an emotional and you talk about it being you know a torch song um album um did did they have a good relationship? You mentioned that your father was obviously culturally aware and very enthusiastic about music and that your mother wasn't. So I just wonder yes. what sort of family that they were and whether they were supportive, whether they were around or whether they were... They are, oh, look, first of all, there's one thing I've got to share. Um, my brother and us, some film of them right just before they got married and my dad sitting at a drum kit He's got a rolled up white shirt. It's in a backyard in London. He's got a rolled up shirt. He's got a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. He's playing drums and I like, yeah. He looks like Mick Jones. His hair, he's sort of like, yeah, what? So sort of, yeah, I'm playing fucking drums, right? And then the camera pans to my mother who's standing there like, like neurotically bored and sullen and like so unimpressed with the drums, the party, the cigarette, the whole thing. She's like completely like, fuck, this is boring. My mother was like, oh, that's nice, son. That's nice, you know. Hey, mum, I just bought a PA and a bloody bass guitar and a old lot cost $5,000. That's nice. What do you want with your egg and chips tonight? You know, that's that would be her attitude. How did you feel about being uprooted as a child and going to Australia? I was only three. Oh, so you didn't really, you didn't really, you weren't that aware, but when, just, you, went, when you went I, to Australia just, and arrived, you must have been an, an, an outsider probably in the, in the first years, purely for the fact that you were English going to Australia and you become no, the outsider or not. How, no, no. You know what? At, at the first school I went to, I'd say, I'd say at least a third of the kids there were English. It was like, and you just hung, you, I just hung, I just hung around with English kids in the playground, um, and and Australians. It wasn't such a, it wasn't. Uh, there was a little bit. To be an English adult was definitely an advantage, and to be an English kid was definitely a slight, a tiny slight disadvantage in this ridiculous microcosm of a high school in Wollongong, of a 
infant school in Wollongong in 1959, but still that still there was a sort of a, a drive towards being Aussie. I mean, um, I'd, I'd like to talk about drive because drive. I mean, if I look at if I look at my life, my father was an emotionally absent father, so he wasn't you know like your father who was culturally aware and also believed in the value um, of culture. So, and I didn't really feel that I had a father in my life. And my mother told me once he died and they'd been separated for years that he didn't want a third child. And so he actually didn't really have a lot of contact with me when I was young. And one of the reasons I came up with that, I got this drive to be on MTV and to be a TV presenter was because I didn't have the love for my father. So I looked for it elsewhere, a sort of compensation, the classic artist um, compensation in a way. And I know that, okay, maybe the roles are a little bit reversed. Your father is very supportive. Your father is helping you, uh, you know, particularly at the early start of your career and also culturally uh, supporting you. And your mother sounds a bit more distant. Have you ever looked at where your drive may have come from? Or do you purely think it's because of the support of your father? Um. You know what? I think my mother's distance might have affected me in my relationship with women, and that and there, it it's very it's interesting. I've never thought about this before. One of the reasons in my day, I'm sorry to say this, but one of the reasons you got into it was to meet women. To put it mildly, it was sort of one of the for a red blooded. A, you know, English speaking male in a rock band, one of the great things was to meet women. If you know, it, not that's just how it was. And you know, um, so I reckon, but I don't think my mother affected my ambition. I think, I think more, um, a few unkind words and a few, uh, just sort of seeing other, seeing bands play and seeing walking around and. And then hearing how kids would talk about the music that they loved at school. Um, I was very influenced by other kids' opinion. I would spend hours. You go in a record shop and I meet a kid from another school in Canberra and he's standing there with a new Pink Floyd record. And he starts telling me all about it. And I'm like all ears. And all the stuff he's saying, I I'm going, I want someone to talk about me like that. I'm sort of, so I, I, I don't think my, my drive came from my parents but though they didn't have any really extraordinary drive, you know, my father could play, but he didn't sort of want particularly care who heard him or not. I, I think it's more sort of um, wanting to feeling like I wasn't very good at anything, so I had to find something to impress them with. That kept me going through bad times or times when I'm lifting a, you know, an endless load of equipment up the back steps in some club where they hated me anyway. And people are jeering at me and I don't getting paid and all of that. You need, you really need to have a bit of, as the Swedes say, some fire in your backbone to be able to get through those periods. Cause some people go, would go, fuck that. That's it. You know, I just, you know, it's that old thing as a musician, as a guy's got $5,000 worth of equipment that he carries around a $500 van to a gig five, you know, 50 miles away to get paid $5, you know, that's how it was. Um, so um, there was even a notorious example. This was where the church had to pay thirty thousand pounds to play with Duran Duran, not to have the pleasure like they're going. Well, that that's a bit. That's the business, Steve. Duran Duran go. We we'll put you in front of like fifty thousand or a hundred thousand kids on this tour. And you want to do that kind of advertising, you can pay for it. So, you know, our record company paid thirty thousand pounds for us to do this English tour. But I couldn't I wasn't up to it. I um after eight gigs, I went, This is no point in this. And the record company go, No, we paid all this money. Carrera it was. I sat down with Jean Claude Carrera or whatever his name name is. And um, he said, You've got to do this. And I went, No, I, it's no point. They hate us. They don't they, no one could steal Duran Duran's audience. It was impossible. It was like they wanted Duran Duran and you were the thing standing between them and Duran Duran. And they thought if they could get rid of you quicker, Duran Duran would come on sooner. They didn't, they were so young and befuddled, they couldn't see that 
inevitably they had someone had to be the opening act and we were a lot better than joe cocker or something you know we were still sort of 27 year old blokes you know that some you know we weren't so completely opposite anyway i've t totally digressed there sorry about no, no, no problem. No, I mean, that you're mentioning about sort of like that feeling of dying on stage, which I think if you're an artist and that, that, that feeling that the audience are not with you must be the ultimate <laughs> not hell. Not with you. Not with you. No, that's an understatement. Not with you. Um, yeah. That's like saying Genghis Khan's here and he's not with us. They were... They were girls just going, I hate, say, they hated us. They, they hated us. Um, we, you know, there are some acts, I imagine, I never saw Prince, but I'm imagining there are some people like Prince, for example, who are so amazingly talented and charismatic and agile in their light show that no matter who would see them, they would go, yes, this is amazing. And then there are other things that I dare say, if you don't know that they're supposed to be amazing, that if you don't understand this is some guy with gravitas or some weirdness or something, if you just took them completely out of context, like take a band like, say, Wire, right? And you put them on before Duran Duran, it's not going to go down. It doesn't matter. It, it, it doesn't matter how... You know, you could put Bob Dylan on before Duran Duran. It wouldn't have mattered who you put on. Out of context, suddenly they would be sort of almost impotent because everybody sort of needs a context. Just like Duran Duran would be laughed off themselves if they supported, I don't know, some fucking throbbing gristle or something. You know what I mean? Like everybody's, every, there's always the sort of a, these two points. And if you're if you're out of context, and, and the church were very much a contextual band. You had to have read our reviews. You had to understand. You had to buy into this trip to dig it. You had to buy into this trip. It wasn't, it was very subjective. It wasn't objective. So quite often we, and we still do, we seem to be suddenly, you walk on stage, you go, oh my God, this, they're not going to, they, they're not going to like this at all. The, Influences that you had as a teenager are very similar to mine because we're not that far apart in age. Um, and I've I've seen interviews where you mention Bowie and uh, Bolan. What did Bowie mean to you back then? I can't talk about one without talking about the other because Bolan was John the Baptist to Bowie's Jesus Christ. Bolan, you had to have Bolan. He Bolan had to soften you up. And open it up. And without Boland, Bo Bowie couldn't have. Bowie, Bowie didn't steal any words or any devices from Boland, but he stole. He didn't steal. He understood this idea. Boland showed him, look what you can do with this. It, it's not like he stole his chords or his singing or anything. But 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 Boland had to be there first. I loved, I had loved lots of other bands. I'd loved lots of other musicians before these guys came along. But when Mark Boland came along, I was 16. And for the first time in my life, I idolized someone. And then a year or two later, sadly and reluctantly, I realized David had usurped Mark in my affections. Along with a friend, there was a friend of mine, this guy I met in a record shop. We both realized we loved T-Rex. He'd already gotten into David Bowie and he and I were like just ringing up each other for hours going, oh, have you seen Mark's? Oh, no. Yeah, no, I can't. You know, have you, have you seen what Mark's shoes this week he's wearing? And uh, David said, you know, he'd rather blah, blah, blah. And we talk about all this stuff for hours. It was so important to us. And one day we had to sadly admit to each other, Mark had released this album, um, well, he'd released uh, Tanks, and we both realized he had lost, he'd lost his magic touch. And at the same time, um, um, Paul, my friend Paul, had lent me David Bowie live in Santa Monica, a bootleg, a bootleg, not even Ziggy Stardust. He'd give me the bootleg of which was Ziggy Stardust and sort of all stuff from the old days when. Bowie doing his old stuff, but now through it, when all the world was very young, 
mountain magic have a hung. Strange games I would play then. And it was like, whoa. And it was like one had to go, this is it. It was like so David Bowie, like when you finally, when the penny dropped. And it, I, I'm sad to say it didn't for me immediately. It didn't for me. I, he had earlier given me Hunky Dory. And I saw begrudgingly like, yeah, yeah, yeah. When it was when it turned into Ziggy Stardust, I don't know how anyone could have resisted that. It was like, it was the absolute best on every level: the best songs, the best playing, the best looking guys, the best words and lyrics, the best production, the best record covers, everything about it for a while there, and it kept on going for me. Uh, beyond that, I I sort of became a really big fan of Bowie and sort of considered myself quite a sort of an ex and Boland too I would consider myself quite an expert considering the number of books I've read about them the number of fucking times I've listened to their record it's like ah uh, you know my Bowie, head is full of that stuff Bowie for me represented um also a place where I wanted to be I mean obviously this is very different because I'm a gay man and when I for me Bowie represented a world I could be comfortable in, not just because he'd sort of said that he was bisexual, but it was more about the audience of Bowie and everyone that was into it was much more um, the sort of outsiders of society. Do you know what I mean? It was very much uh, the the people totally. that I liked. And so totally. well, that was for you as it, well then, in a, in a way. It was, a, it was a, oh, I was mincing around my mother would come home and go, Stephen, you've been in my makeup again. I told you, don't put the pond screen there. And and then she, my mother helped. When I was 19, I dyed my hair bright red. My mother helped me do it. My father came home, sat down at the table, and he had like cognitive dissonance. He looked at it. He looked at my hair, and his, he, the, his eyes refused to tell his brain what was going. He looked at it and went, what's for dinner, darling? And he just couldn't dig it. No, I was, I was like, um, I embraced every bit of it. The whole thing was a total package. It was a world. It, it was a, it was a world. It was a sound. It was a feeling. It was the other people who, if you met someone who was into it, you know, like I'm walking around Canberra in 1973 in Australia with my hair dyed bright red. I attracted, you know, people, people got the message. Oh, you like David Bowie? And I remember my proudest moment one time I was driving home from work with my bright red hair. And um, these guys drove past and one of them held up a picture of pinups and went, it's you, it's you, it's you. And I was like, I've made it, I've made it. <laughs> well, I'll tell you my story about having a Bowie Ziggy Stardust haircut. I was at school at the time and I used to get the bus into school. And at the next village, another group of kids from another school would get on and at the weekend I'd had my uh, Ziggy Stardust and I had sort of orange hued hair in any case so I had my Ziggy Stardust haircut and I was extremely proud and as we sort of the bus drove into the bus stop all these kids were looking at me shouting like oh look at him look at him and then one shout shouted out it's Linda McCartney <laughs> <laughs> and I was mortified absolutely mortified that's <laughs> hilarious I just want to, you, you mentioned Bowie and the sound and what's interesting, um, you know, I'm going to talk obviously about your own music uh, later, apart from the church, but in terms of the church, there is a very particular sound and you got your first guitar. I think you were something around the age of 16 when you got your first yep. guitar. Who yep. helped you learn the guitar? Was it self-taught and, and how did that develop into as sound for the church, which would come obviously a lot later. Um, well, I, I got a bass guitar and I just fooled around with it um, and sort of figured it out. And I, I, cause my dad was kind enough to buy me an amp. I was very attractive to boys who were out there who had electric guitars, but didn't have amps. And my amp you could plug into as well. So I could play bass through my amp and two other kids could plug, or three other kids sometimes, could plug electric guitars in and strum along on the amp. And so um, we kind of figured it all out then. And then one day I 
met a guy in a record shop and he was a few old, years older than me and his name was Ben. And he said, I hear you're playing bass guitar. And I, I said, yeah. And he said, I'll come around and give you a one hour lesson for $5. I'll teach you everything you need to know. I said, you're on. And Ben came round, and by God, he taught me major scales, minor scales, slurring, sliding, harmonics. He taught me, he gave me the nutshell of playing the bass guitar in one hour, took his $5, and I never saw him again. And I still stand on stage, and I'll play something and go, oh, Ben would have liked that. You know, it's a scale. So so that was really it. Um, I Then when I got the four tracks, the domestic four track, I developed a sound. However, it would be really remiss of me to say that the sound was all completely my own, although the songs were. I I was aided and abetted by um our first drummer was a real dud. He was a bully from my school. I never should have had him in the band. But our second drummer from our second drummer and the first two guitarists, Marty Wilson Pipe and Peter Coppers, who played in the church. They were they were very influential in in forming that sound. I can't claim all the credit for that, only for the songs. And some of the and some of my writing was already like that. And some of it we all kind of influenced each other. Um, Peter was <clears throat> Peter was a really good musician right from the word go. And I played with him in earlier bands, and and we were kind of friends, and we played together. Um, <clears throat> Marty, I enjoy I invited to join the band because he looked so good. And then he he was an okay guitarist, but he rapidly improved. And by the second, third, fourth albums, he was re he was really sort of turned into himself. So I was very lucky to have those guys. We were just, we were, we were at the sum total of all our influences. You know, everybody loved um, Cockney Rebel and Bebop Deluxe. Everybody liked Bowie. Everybody sort, sort of liked Boland to an extent. Marty and I liked Frog Rock. Peter liked um, Jimi Hendrix and like he liked a bit more of that sort of stuff. And our drummer was a really young, kind of speedy, crazy guy, but um, he just loved everything. He just loved playing. And it just sort of all all got shaken together with, and with my songwriting and sort of came out the way it did, I think. It was sort of, it, there was no real master plan behind that. I mean, of Skins and Heart was an early... Um, success and it defined your sound in many ways and it's something that you've revisited uh, uh, in an acoustic version yourself. Um, yeah. That, well, freedom does it give you in terms of doing something like that as an acoustic version to doing to, to in terms of looking back at what that was as the church, what freedom did it give you? Um, I it it let me it let me um settle some sort of um ideas. I thought some of the record was sort of. First of all, let me say this: I wouldn't have done it except I met a guy who sort of said why don't you do this? I've got a record company. It's one of the things I'm sort of like to do is put out reissues of records or, or records done acoustically. He was really into that idea. And I'd been doing some shows playing the first four albums. Um, in one night, I'd do all four, the first four albums acoustically. And it was sort of like an interesting, just one of those things old rockers do. You know, it just is like after a while, like if you've been around long enough, you go, wow. I wonder what the acoustic version of my old rock and roll songs would sound like. Yeah, you know, I can just do it on my own and put it out and probably sell a load of copies and make a load of moolah. You can't you can't ever discount that factor. Uh Steve, I can't I didn't have a burning need to do that. It was more um it was more um expedient to do it. <laughs> There's a challenge involved, though, isn't there? There's a challenge involved when you're actually redoing songs. You know, I mean, songs like The Unguarded Moment or Is This Where You Live, which are sort of etched into the minds of, of so many of the church's fans. So for you, there is a challenge to do those as an acoustic version, I would have thought. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
it's not it's not too far a stretch. I just think about what those other guys played and sort of like what I could manage. And sometimes I sort of, for interest's sake, I slow them down and slow them right down. So a song that, like, when I do these acoustic versions, a song that might have been quite fast becomes something else. Sometimes I change the time signature. I always say to the audience, when I made that album, at that time in Australia in 1980, there was very much this guitar thing called Mute Palm Ostinato, which sounds like, tick, 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 You know what I mean? Every song on the radio is going, tick, 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 tick. All the American bands, tick, 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 tick. And um, a lot of it got onto the record. Uh, I sort of against, I, I sort of didn't really notice that that's what should be happening. Um, and, and then I, the, the chance to do it acoustically is to slightly redress some of that. And like, here's this song without juke, 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 juke. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I think that there's, I, I can see the challenge and I can see the, um, positive side of actually being able to revisit things as well. What, one thing that really interests me was that you and the band at that point, you know, after a couple of years, the success sort of went away and it must have been a very difficult um, moment in terms of thinking about what do we do now? Because it does sound like the initial point was about orientation towards success. You know, you mentioned that uh, the, the truth was that also you get the girls if you're the rock star. <laughs> so so the orientation is to success. If you're not successful, you're no longer getting the girls in a way. So how did it feel after that um, initial success um, and that you hadn't had the complete breakthrough? Well, um, disappointing. <laughs> disappointing, you know, and, um, um, you know, I think I didn't understand... Um, I didn't understand that over a long lifespan that things would go up and down all the time. I think at the moment the church is sort of in a bit of a dip and hoping that maybe we sort of get, get up onto the top of the wave again. Um, but at that point it seemed like the end of the world and people were saying in 1983, 84, they're finished, they're washed up. People weren't, weren't so many people coming to our concerts. Really, really people were saying, oh, they're old hat, they're washed up. You know, they should have seen themselves lucky they lasted till 1983. And guys in record company, a guy pulled me into the record company at EMI and showed me a video of Spandau Ballet and said in his Aussie accent, mate, if you don't get like that, you'll be out of a job by this time next year. I'm looking at a guy playing whatever it was in the kill, you know? And I'm going, gee, I, I don't think this is going to be for me. Um, and then, you know, American record companies at the time, would, we got dropped and nobody wanted to sign us up. And then Warner Brothers signed us up and dropped us again. And it was sort of like a, it was, it was and some, some people in the British press liked us and some thought we were hopeless. And, you know, um, the latest tour we're doing in Australia is called Supper the Slings and Arrows of Outrageous Fortune. And you've really got to learn to do that. And when it first started happening, like I was really cool with not being successful. And I was, I would slog away and I wasn't reproaching myself. I'd slog away, I'd slog away. But once to taste just that little bit of success and then feel it sort of, um, it's like sitting in a bath that's getting cold and you go, oh my God, the bath's getting cold. That's what it feels like as the sort of popularity ebbs away and the, the attention and all the, you know, you're no longer the, you know, the cause celebraire. I mean, at, at that time, I just wondered the, you know, I talked about this before about the idea of compensation for the artist, but the, the, the stuff that uh, you've made in the last few years, something like Hall of Counterfeits is much more introspective, it's very deep, and it feels like there is um, more of a, a of a compensation going on in that sort of music. Do you know? As because I'm a what I mentioned at the beginning, I'm a screenwriter, 
And obviously I write about the themes that have been important in my life. And they do provide a sort of therapeutic journey as well. Um, and your later music seems to be much more uh, deeper and therapeutic and your your earlier music, um, and it's probably to do with uh, youth and, and being younger, but was there, a, was there a form of compensation in what you were writing at that time? No, it was all, it was all lyrically, it was all bullshit. Um, you know, all the, you know, all the, what was it? Someone said, um, Belle Dame San Merci. Um, the, the beautiful, all, my songs were full of beautiful women without mercy who were treating me bad and dying and breaking my heart and running off with other guys. And, you know, songs, just like Frank Sinatra is, they're, they're, you know, I'm trying to do the Torch album thing, but mine were just completely, I, I know it was very like, and, and I don't take anything away from them. It was like, as it was no realer than Ziggy Stardust was real. It was sort of like a fantasy world, you know, the, the one critic wrote, boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy retires to darken room with guitar to forever write songs about it. That's fantastic. It's a, and and it, sort, it sort of was, you know, it was like, it was there was the Frank Sinatra thing coming back. I'm going to be a torch singer. I'm going to sing about these, the doomed love affairs with imaginary beautiful, you know, I might've been living in domestic bliss at any particular point in time with somebody, but still I had on that record, there were 10 women who had, you know, tried to kill me or had dropped dead or had disappeared or had drowned or had had too much laudanum and belladonna. You know what I mean? It was like real Percy Biff Shelley stuff I was going for. I mean, one of those women was the, the, the and I've forgotten her name, I've, I've written it down somewhere, the Swedish woman who um, you wrote uh, Under the Milky Way with, or I presume, in a sense, was yes. part of the inspiration of that. I know you've told the story a million times, but it's something that I really want to hear again about how that came about, and also whether that song had any relation to what was going on in Sweden at the time, because Sweden has a sort of history of folk music. And in the 80s, it was changing and developing immensely um, because there it was um, so many people from outside Sweden were coming into Sweden as well. They had a sort of um, change in their, in their music scene in the 80s. And I just wondered how much in relation to Sweden, in relation to her, uh, was this song developed? When I first turned up in Sweden, Corin uh, was a was a punk rocker in an all girl, all female band, all girl. Fe oh yeah, all the girls were females in that band. That makes sense. A female band um, called Pink Champagne, and the music that they liked was kind of um, was like the Clash. It was about politics and um, sort of wasn't so. And in the background, every now and then, I would hear this Swedish folk music and these schlager, this schlager music, and um, I didn't really know what to make of it. Um, anyway, Corin, Corin came to Australia, and we sort, of, we were always sort of mucking around with songs together. I had, a, I had my little bedroom studio, and she'd come in, and sometimes I'd help her to record her songs, or sometimes she'd get other people, and we we're always like. She was always singing on something or I was always playing a bit of bass on a song she'd written. And um, one night we went to see my mother and um, <clears throat> after dinner, my mother demanded that someone dry up, wash, uh, dry, dry up the plate. She would wash up and you would stand there and dry up and talk to her. And I realised that if I ducked off quickly enough after dinner, Corin would get lumbered with that. So um, I ran away into the garage where they had a piano and I sat down at the piano and I um, I smoked some marijuana and I started playing this chord progression. And 10 minutes later, Corin came out after she'd finished having to talk to my mother and do the dishes. And she sat down and said, oh, that's nice. What's that? And I said, I don't know, just something. And we just sat there 
and and she she sort of encouraged me. Dad, keep playing that. That's really good. I said, you really think so? She's going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we went outside and we just sort of um, made up some words and that was really the end of it. And then it, so I sort of wrote it on piano when I transposed it to an, a guitar and a bass. So instead of it all, the bass being part of the piano note going on, when it was actually a bass guitar, it had a whole different feeling. I made a little demo of it and um, nobody really liked it. But our manager, the one brilliant thing our manager ever did, he spotted it on my demo tape with all the other songs and him and the drummer, who ironically never got to play on it because they used uh, this drummer in America. Um, they insisted we do it when we got to America to make that album. Um, nobody really liked it. Not even me. I, I mean, I didn't dislike it, but I didn't think much about it. You know, I thought, oh, yeah. I was sort of saying, I'll... I'll I was deciding because I hadn't been doing very well. I was deciding for once I was going to stop trying to run everything, put myself into other people's hands, these guys in America. What could it hurt? We had three months in America. We were staying in a nice place, swimming pool. Everybody had a car, smoking good weed. I'll just go in the studio. These guys want to do Under the Milky Way. I'll do Under the Milky Way. We tried at a rehearsal. They didn't like it. They sent me in a studio in the middle of this complex. It was called The Complex. And in the middle of The Complex was a little studio and there was a guy in there who was like this nerdy guy and he liked smoking weed. And we sat in there and we put Under the Milky Way together on this instrument called a Sinclavia. And we gave it back to him. The other guys did all their things. The producers decided our drummer wasn't good enough to play. They got in, I think it was Russ Kunkel, who played it on these kind of synthy drum things. It's not a real drum kit. And he sat there, I remember watching him and it was, it was something, they worked on it for hours, getting this drum beat exactly right. I don't think that would have happened if Richard had played on it. The record, the record was put together. Clive Davis came in. Nobody thought about Under the Milky Way. And Clive Davis heard the record. We didn't play it to him in order. We, it wasn't sequenced, I think. We played him this, we played him this, we played him this. But when we played him Under the Milky Way, he turned around and went, that's it. That song is a hit. And then from that moment on, everybody's attitude towards it changed. And he said, that's a hit. And then as he walked out of the studio, each of the guys that were with him stopped and shook my hand and said, that's a hit. And then the next guy go, that's a hit. And the next guy, that's a hit. And they all said that on the way out. And then they, they made their own prophecy come true. They couldn't have done it. But when he said it, he, he like, made it happen he said this is going to be a hit and they for example they um they took all the journalists in to observatories and played them the album and they tilted them back and opened up the whatever it is and did all that stuff and played the album to them they wined them and dined them and you know courted them and they really made it happen and and then we got in that incredible position where, you know, every now and then on the charts, there's a song that's sort of usually a bit too subtle to really be on the charts. But everybody sort of feels when they like it, they really congratulate themselves like, wow, I like Year of the Cat by Al Stewart. You know, it's not like the other sh shit that's on the radio. It's sort of subtle and has a story and, you, you know, it goes somewhere and has these whimsical plays on words. Under the Milky Way became a version of that. It's sort of like, it was a sort of very subtle hit and, you know, people, people kind of really liked, they, people like every now and then for a song to come along. That's kind of not your bash them over the head pop song. It's something that's sort of, sort of whimsical or, you know. Isn't it also about that we interpret as a listener, I'm talking that we interpret our own emotions and our own yeah. lives into yeah. a song. And for me, yeah. it probably means something completely different to, you know, the, the person next door or whatever. It that they're thinking of a completely different. To me, it's an amazingly uh, romantic, I mean, a very sort of like beautiful romantic projection of, of what I would like in my life. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and you Yeah. And, but that song has had a life of its own because of that, hasn't it? Um, and, um, okay. This is, this is my, in lyric writing, 
and I discovered this with Frank Sinatra, and I've always kept in mind, the most important thing is ambiguity. Ambiguity so that everybody can dig it. You go one, you go two, you don't, if you go too far, you turn into meaninglessness, and if you go too far the other way, then you're telling people exactly what they should be thinking. But somewhere is this sublime sweet spot of ambiguity where each listener can hear a song, my song or other songs that are like that, that I thought about. Because I would listen to a song that had ambiguity and was, I'm going, now this feels like this guy's singing to me and yet it's a very ambiguous song. How is he actually doing that? And I was sort of, so when, by the time I was writing songs like Under the Milky Way, I'm specializing in this idea of leaving this, giving them guidelines and letting the song, letting the words just be a sprinkle on top of what the music's already telling them. But if you tell them too much, um, and, and so having the right mixture of hope and longing and desire and yearning and all that stuff to make people feel this kind of, yeah, you know, I wish I was, but I, so many people, to so many people, it means so many different things. And I never, I never say that is right or that is wrong. It's like, that's what it's all about. I also, I also think that there's a, we as the listening public, we connect to artists on a much deeper level. And that deeper level is often uh, whatever their, I think this, whatever their wounds in their um, childhood or their wounds or their wants in their childhood. And obviously in all music, when you're creative in any creative process, you are putting part of you thematically into something. It may not be completely expressed in the lyrics, and it may be that you haven't written it, but you're performing it. And because you're the performer, you can bring that part of that song across, which may be even different to the writer. What we connect, how we connect as the audience is we have our own wounds and everyone has their own wounds in some way, however small and big they are. And in some way, the wounds are what connects us through the music. Do you think that's uh, a logical theory. I mean, I can give you examples in terms of just a singer like Tina Turner, who said when she was 45, I think, in her biography, that she'd never experienced love in her life, not from a man, not from her parents. Yet her greatest hit was What's Love Got to Do With It, written by Terry Britton. Stevie Wonder, sort of similar uh, um, experience. His father was incredibly violent, and Stevie, when he was a very young boy, witnessed that. And his mother packed the kids in the car, went to Detroit, and the new life started. Stevie Wonder has a child. And he writes, isn't she lovely made from love? Possibly because he felt he wasn't made from love from his father. The reason I connected to that song <laughs> is because I felt exactly that, that my father didn't love me. And I played that song endlessly. So I think there's some sort of deeper connection going on. And I don't know what, what to call it in a way. But it is, I think, to do with our own wounds, your wounds and artists' wounds, where we, we connect somehow through the ether and the music is the trigger for that connection. I, I agree. Um, I agree with a lot of what you say, but I don't think it's only the wounds, though the wounds are important. But I think it's also the... Um, when the when the really for me when the really great when the Dylans and the Bowies and the Bolands imagine a world and they back it up with this special music and when when it all when it, it isn't all always about wounds it's also about sort of like wow you know it could be like this or for for the three minutes that I'm listening to the song I've entered that world and not only that but every time I put that record on if I sit there and play it over and over and over, I will enter it. And some of those songs are so good that even 50 years later, I can still put it on and still enter that world. I mean, that's really the gift that goes on giving when a song can go on doing that. I, I don't, for example, with me, I have no great wounds. Like, you know, yeah, my mother wasn't that jazzed on me, but I never got beaten. I never got molested. There was a roof over our head. I went to a school where kids weren't flogged. You, you know what I mean? It was like I had a very woundless, like relatively woundless life. I never, nothing really bad ever happened to me that I didn't cause myself. 
So I sort of, I, I would imagine, I say, I guess if I was sometimes singing about wounds, I was singing about imaginary wounds, like a writer, you know, when you write a screenplay and someone in the screenplay has, has an unfortunate experience, you've got to imagine that if that hasn't actually happened to you. I guess that's what I sort of did as a songwriter. I'm sort of like, you know, it's like, there was no way I could have done all the things that happened in the song. I was too busy touring around and being in studios. And yet in the, in the albums, as I say, there's all these wonderful catastrophic sort of love affairs all sort of going wrong. Um, that never really happened. So definitely wounds real and imaginary definitely bind people together there's a there's this just this feeling you get when you're at that right age when you're between 12 and 18 or whatever it is and the right musician comes along and you get that connection that's like it's it's a deep it's something you can't even <clears throat> you can never really properly grow out of and you can never analyze it away you can never go Oh, he used to look silly doing that, these silly words and all that. Yet still, the magic will remain in the music. You won't be able to resist it. It's like it's become part of you. But after that age, after that sort of very impressionable age as a young man or woman, you know, between 12 and 18, I, I don't think things can sort of take their deep root in you anymore. Things become pleasant and you like them and but but it's not like the the you know the stuff that happened in those teenage years, which is like when I guess when you were boys and looking for mentors back in Greece, you know, and you would meet some guy and he would teach you everything he knows. When you sort of listen to David Bowie, when you listen to Ziggy Stardust, he sort of teaches you everything he knows that, and he promises you everything he that's good, you know. Um, it, it but it is. It is no doubt a really, you know, that thing gets you, grabs you, and, and then you're grabbed forever. That's amazing. Steve, I'm going to end it there. And the reason I'm going to end okay. it there is because I'm going to ask you if I can come back and do another hour on your projects, your music, and bring that really up to date. Because I think there's a, there's definitely another interview Steve, in there. Steve, and, I'm, I've always got an hour for you. Brilliant. What a lovely oh, day. And I just want to say one thing at the end, because I think it's it's really important. You have made an enormous contribution to popular culture, and I want to thank you for that. So, Steve Gilby, thank you, thanks Steve. very much. Thank you. Humbly thank you very much. I'll speak to you soon, mate. Up there is an interview I recommend. Down there is where you can find all the podcast interviews and here is where you can connect.